Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for our conference, Rich Harwood. Now, I've had the opportunity to work with Rich and the Harwood Institute over the last year on education mobilization. I know Michelle is working with him now on income mobilization as well. Now, you're going to see this guy, and you're going to think, boy, he looks nice and sweet. And then every single day, he challenges us. He challenges us to look outward. He challenges us to engage the community. He challenges us to think of this work differently. And I know for a fact our work in Toledo has changed because of their help. The Harwood Institute for Public Innovation, which he founded and now serves as president, is one of our signature partners for the Campaign for Common Good. Rich has also provided essential tools, training, and resources as we build local mobilization strategies. By inspiring people to step forward and take action rooted in their communities, Rich is helping not only United Way, but many other organizations, communities, and individuals make decisions that lead to greater and more sustained impact. He's a frequent media commentator. He's written two books and authored many studies on vital issues of our time, including education and health care. So please join me in welcoming Rich Harwood. Hello, United Way. Good morning. Thanks, Bill, for that great introduction. Weren't, weren't those performers incredible? I'm not talking about Joe Haggerty there, though. I wonder if you'd give me, it's great to be here, and it's great, uh, I'm honored to be able to help kick off your conference today. And I wonder if you'd give me a few minutes to talk about the condition of our country, why I believe America needs United Way now, perhaps more than ever before in our history, and what I think it's going to take for each of us as leaders to step forward and create the kind of change and impact that we know that we all want. You know, just a couple of days ago, I returned from visiting Germany with my 21-year-old daughter, Emily, where we went to the Dachau concentration camp. After being there for a day, my daughter and I were having dinner, and I said to her, there's something that keeps drawing me back to the camp. I don't think I'm done yet. And so my daughter gave me the greatest gift that a daughter can give to her father. She said, Dad, let's cancel everything tomorrow, and you should go back by yourself. And so I woke up at 5.30 the next morning. I hopped on the train to Dachau. I got there at 7 a.m. thinking that the camp doesn't open till 9. And as I walked there, not a soul was around. I walked up to the gate, the gate that the prisoners were taken through to come into the camp, and I pushed it, and it opened. And so I went into the camp. I was the only one there, this vast concentration camp. And I went to the courtyard where they used to bring the prisoners to have roll call in the morning and the evening to make sure everyone was accounted for. And I stood in the middle of that courtyard, which is about three or four size football fields. And there in the silence of that camp, as I said my Hebrew prayers, and tears were streaming down my eyes, it was a sober reminder that indifference does exist in our world, that apathy does exist that there are times when we turn our backs on one another and even hide from one another. And so after standing in the courtyard for about an hour, I walked towards the north wall of the camp, back towards the crematory in the gas chamber. And there was an opening in the north wall that hadn't been there the day before. And so I decided to walk through that door. And in, I walked into another courtyard, this one a small one. And what I found there was a monastery founded by the Sisters of Carmel. And I saw the vestments that they created out of the tattered clothes of the prisoners. And I saw another door, and I walked into that, and it was a small chapel. And I sat there for 20 minutes and prayed. And then when I came out of that, I saw another door with a window next to it. And I walked over to it, and I peered into the window. And back looking at me was a sister in her habit. And so she came around and opened the door and invited me in. And we sat there and talked for a while. As I walked from the monastery's courtyard back into the death camp, I also recognized that there is innate goodness in us, that there is a way to restore our belief in ourselves and in one another, that one person stepping forward can make a difference. I'm here today because America needs United Way more now than ever before. That's right. That's right. I don't need to tell you 
We're still living through one of the worst recessions in American history. Our politics are toxic. There's too much acrimony and divisiveness. We don't trust our leaders, including not only in Washington, D.C., but in many of our communities. And we have organizations that seem to be working more for their own good than for the common good. And yet, as I travel this country, what I find among Americans is a deep yearning to re-engage and reconnect, not to be indifferent, but to come back into the public square, not to be apathetic, but to become part of something larger than themselves, not to turn their backs, but to join hands and join arms to make a difference in each other's lives. But as you know, there's nothing automatic. Nothing is automatic. And so there's a question on the minds of Americans that I believe we in this room need to be able to answer. And the question is this, who can I trust? Who can I trust to create safe spaces for people to come back into the public square without the finger pointing in the acrimony so that we can get some work done? Who can I trust to put issues on the public agenda that matter in my life, not just to my board or my funders, but in my daily life? How can the mother, the single mom with two children, when she knows she's sending them to an inadequate school every morning, how can we ensure that we're creating impact that will actually change those schools so her kids have a better life? Who can I trust to mobilize us, not just for make work or nice volunteer activities, but to bring us together to create change in our communities? Who can I trust? It seems to me if we want to earn people's trust, then we must turn outward toward them. Too many of us are turned inward toward our own organizations, our own survival, our own strategic plans. And it seems to me we need to put the community first and our organization in service of that community. We need to stay focused on people and not get entangled in process. We need to focus on impact and not get lost in all our activities. And so this morning, as I stand here before you, I have three questions going through my mind about turning outward that I want to ask you to think about. The first one is this. If I asked you to come with me into your community, and I asked 150 people from your community to come into the room with us, and I asked you to stand up on the table in front of those 150 people and tell them about their aspirations, about their concerns in their lives, about their hopes and their dreams, could you do it? Could you do it? I want to ask my rabbi, a good friend of mine, in one of the smallest congregations in Washington, D.C., but we're ranked in the top 20 by Newsweek as having one of the most vibrant and connected communities in the country. I said, Danny, if I asked 150 of our fellow congregants to come into the sanctuary, and I ask you to stand up on a table and tell them not about the Jewish religion, but about their lives, could you do it? And he said, no. He said, no. What about each of us? What about each of us? The second question, am I fulfilling my pledges and promises? And here I'm not asking you to think about all your metrics and all your activities and all your plans. What I'm asking you to do is to go home and in the silence, and privacy of your own home, close your eyes and think about the central promise you have made to your community, the solemn promise that you have made to your community about the change that you said you're going to create. Do you believe that you're fulfilling those pledges and promises? Not have you implemented all your activities or programs, not even effectively, but are you fulfilling your pledges and promises? The third question, the third question is, are you staying true to your urge within? What I've found with leaders is that the only way we can get through turbulent times is to know what makes us go, what motivates us. And each of us, each of us came to this room because we were motivated by something that existed within us before we ever entered this room. An urge to do good, an urge to make a difference, an urge to be part of something larger than ourselves. And yet in our society, in our long laundry list of activities, we often lose sight of that urge. It gets disconnected, discarded, denigrated. And what I'm here to say today is that urge is our most precious gift. It's what enables you to keep going in hard times. 
Turning outward reminds me of an experience I had in Flint, Michigan 15 years ago. We had worked in the community for a number of years, engaging people in conversations about their aspirations and their lives. And we invited everyone who had been part of these conversations to the old Ramada Hotel, which was in downtown Flint on Saginaw Street. It was snowing that night. We thought no one would show up. And one by one, the people of Flint filed through that hotel door into that ballroom to talk about their community. And I asked them, what do you think, now that you've heard some of the things that you've said, what do you think ought to happen in your community? And the first person stood up and said, well, I think the Community Foundation needs to do something. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see this gentleman on my right. You know, when you're in a meeting, it looks like someone wants to say something. I could see him out of the corner of my eye, and there he was on the right-hand side, but then he shook me off. You've all experienced that, I'm sure. So another person stood up and said, well, you know, the Chamber of Commerce needs to do something. And at the very same time, I saw this guy lean forward again in his chair, but he shook me off again. And so another person stood up and said, well, the United Way needs to do something. And then I saw the guy, and he leaned forward even more. I came to know that his name was Mr. Brooks, and this time he was ready to speak. Mr. Brooks was an older gentleman, and like a lot of us who are getting older, you know what I'm talking about. He grabbed both, took both his hands and grabbed the side of the table and pulled himself up. And there he stood. He was a short guy. And there he stood, and he looked out over the crowd at his fellow neighbors and folks from Flint. And he uttered three words that day that I will never forget. He said, what about us? What about us? What about us in this room? What are we going to do? What about us? Five years later, I was sitting in the private conference room of a foundation president who funded all our work in Flint. And I was sitting across from the executive vice president, and she turned to me with anger in her voice, and she said, but Rich, you didn't say Flint. And I looked at her and I said, no, and I never made that promise. And in fact, one person will never say Flint, and surely not someone from outside of Flint. But if you're willing to come with me outside this conference room, down onto Saginaw Street, and go four blocks in any direction, I can show you the good work that the Eastside Civic Association is doing. I can show you the good work that Salem Housing Task Force is doing. I can show you the good work that the Neighborhood Crime Prevention Group is doing. And I can show you the good work that the United Way is doing. Right before I got on the plane for Dachau, I got an email from a woman named Annie Oper at Woodside Church in Flint. One of the greatest privileges I had was to preach there one Sunday morning. The header was, Kiplinger Magazine names Flint, Michigan, one of the 11 comeback communities for 2011. And there was one line in her email to me. Dear Rich, all our long-term efforts are paying off. Are paying off. What was it? that the people in Flint were able to summon from themselves to step forward and do the work that they needed to do? What was it that enabled them to come together in ways that they hadn't before to do this work? What was it that enabled them to still have hope? To still have hope. What is it that enables each of us, or will enable each of us, to keep going in the work that we're doing? And it seems to me, as I've been working with United Ways and other groups across the country, there are lots of things that it comes down to, but there are two fundamental things that we always have to keep in mind. The first one we tend to spend a lot of time talking about, but I'm not sure how good we are at doing it, and it's courage. I think we need courage. I think we need the courage to put a stake in the ground in each of our communities so that when someone visits a community in your, in your town, they can say, I know what my United Way stands for. I know the cause that it has embraced. I know where it's putting all its resources. I know how it's mobilizing people. And it is clear as day what we're up to. We need the courage to put that stake in the ground. We need the courage to engage people who have been left out or left behind, whose voices we have not heard, 
and whose communities we might feel a bit uncomfortable going into. But nonetheless, if we want to turn outward and earn people's trust, we must have the courage to do that. We must have the courage to let go of our legacy partners, who too often are holding us down and holding us back. It's time to let go and find partners who are ready to go in a community impact direction. We need to have the courage to no longer believe that we have to be all things to all people. If we want to create change, it's going to require making choices, and not everyone's going to like our choices. Which leads me to one more point about courage. We have to be willing to make a bet. We have to be willing to make a bet. The bet that the number of people who will decide to no longer support United Way when we move in our new direction, or as you accelerate your move in that direction, the number of people who will decide that they don't believe in what you're doing, well, I'm here to say the bet is that there are many more people on the sidelines who are ready to re-engage and reconnect if we can earn their trust and demonstrate that we can create change. That's the bet I think we need to make. That's the bet I think we need to make. Now, courage by itself, as you know, often leads to kind of false bravado. It often leads to arrogance. It can lead to hubris. It can lead us astray. And so there's a flip side that I think we need if we want to exercise courage in our work and in our lives, and that's humility. I think we need more humility if we're going to do this work. We need the humility to know that when we put that stake in the ground, there will come a time, there will come a time when we will have to pick it up and move it, and we're going to have to do it in public before people. It will be because the conditions in our communities have changed, or quite possibly we put it in the wrong place to begin with. That's a possibility. We need the humility to open ourselves up to hear what people have to say to us, even when it may be painful to us, even when it may be painful to us. We need the humility to know that we can set audacious goals, but we can't do all the work. And so we have to peel off our piece of the contribution and make sure we put a stake in the ground about that, but not believe that we can go it alone. We need humility to know that we can't always take all the credit, because we need to share it if we want others to come on the journey with us. It seems to me that we need humility if we want to exercise courage. One goes with the other, and one without the other is an empty promise, is an empty promise. As I think about this work, I think about what it is that keeps each of us moving forward, what it is that enables us to get up every morning and do the things that we need to do, what enables us to keep going in the face of adversity. And for me, I've come to understand clearly what that is. And each of us has our own story. For me, when I was born, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. In the early 1960s, that was a death sentence. The doctor turned to my mother at some point and said, you have to face it, he's a lemon. No one expected me to make it this far, and certainly no one expected me to have the honor to speak before you today. I spent most of my childhood in a hospital and a lot of my adulthood as well. I spent it with doctors and nurses and specialists surrounding my hospital bed, all talking to each other, but never talking to me. Never talking to me. When it came to hope, I thought, based on experience, that it was likely that tomorrow was going to be worse than today. And so even as I travel across the country almost every week, when I walk into a hotel room, it reminds me of a hospital room. And so it's only recently, in the last few years, that I even get undressed in a hotel room to sleep or turn off the lights, or turn off the lights. But I was lucky. I was lucky. In my life, I bumped into a guy named Ray Rivers, who coached me in youth sports from the time I was 10 all the way up. And Ray was the guy who drove the tractor around Saratoga Racetrack during the summer to smooth out the course after the thoroughbreds ran after each race. 
I joined Ray's basketball team when I was eight or nine, ten years old. And what we found out was that most of our games were on Saturday mornings. And my parents insisted, just like I did with my kids, that I had to go to religious school. Ray found this out. And unbeknownst to me, he went to all his fellow coaches. And he sat down and he said, I've got this nice little Jewish boy who wants to play ball. And they sat there over beers, and they changed the schedule so I could play. Every game, so I could play. I've coached youth sports for 30 years now. I've never experienced that. I've never experienced that. Ray was a guy, when I played ball with his son Danny in high school during the winter, when it got really dark and cold in upstate New York after practice, Ray was the guy who picked eight of us up every night. We followed into his car, a beat-up Chevy Impala. The vinyl seat split, pulled back. The car had this kind of strange odor. <laughs> but Ray was there every night, every night, to make sure each of us kids got home safely and that we were on the right path. When Ray and his wife, Mrs. Rivers, used to come home from shopping, I'll never forget this. I used to spend a lot of time over at his house. They bring the the bags in from food shopping, and they'd put them on the counter in their kitchen. I'm, I'm pretty sure they used government assistance to buy those groceries. But Ray was always the first one to say, come on in, kids, take whatever you want. Let's have a picnic. Let's eat. Let's drink together. Ray Rivers, it seems to me, is the very type of people we're talking about in the work that we're doing. And each of us has a Ray Rivers in our lives. But you know something? It's easy to turn our back on people like Ray Rivers. It's easy to hide from them. It's easy not to hear their voice. When I went to Princeton and I was taking a trade policy class that was being taught by an assistant secretary of commerce who used to come up on the Amtrak train from Washington, D.C. to teach the course. And we were talking about auto workers in Ohio and in Flint, Michigan. I raised my hand one day and said, what happens to those auto workers when their jobs are lost? This is in the middle of the 1980s when a lot of jobs are being lost. And you know what my professor said to me? That's an irrelevant question. That's an irrelevant question. When I was 23 years old and I worked on my 20th political campaign, a U.S. presidential race, and I was the junior aide to all the senior people, and I sat in all the polling meetings, the messaging meetings, the meetings about our TV ads, I didn't see Ray Rivers reflected in our conversations. I didn't see him reflected in our ads. I didn't see him reflected in the spirit of what we were trying to do. It was clear to me at that time that my calling was not to needlessly divide people, but to find ways to repair breaches in our society. And when I went to work in Midtown Manhattan for a swanky nonprofit right out of graduate school after the, my presidential campaign, a chemical plant, Institute West Virginia, blew. And we were asked to come down and help the community figure out what it could do. People were scared. They were frightened. They didn't know what they could do to make themselves safer. And I'll never forget my colleagues from New York City flying back from one of our trips saying to me, I never want to go back there again. The people drive beat up cars. They're wearing dirty clothes. There's an odor. They were talking about Ray Rivers. They were talking about Ray Rivers. Our work, our work is about a purpose. It's about making a difference in the world. It's about ensuring that no one gets left behind, that no one gets left behind. So in conclusion, what I want to tell you, for me at least, and I know this is true for you, that there's nothing academic about the work that we do, though sometimes it sounds academic. That we need to protect ourselves from never allowing us to become so entangled in our process that all we think we need to do is check off the box and keep going to the next step without thinking about what we're doing and the pledges we've made and the work that we need to do on behalf of our communities. That we need to know that even as we reach for our survival to create a new business model, that that business model alone is not enough. 
It's the core of our work we need to do. And so for me, this work is a fight. Not a process, but a fight. A fight to ensure that every person in our communities has a voice and a place at the table, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of which side of town they live on, regardless of how much money they have in their wallet, regardless of what kind of car they drive. It's a fight to ensure that we create impact so that mother with two kids sending them to inadequate public school, that she has a sense of hope that we can make a change in her life. It is a fight to ensure that we can restore our belief in ourselves and in one another, that we have the individual and the collective ability to make change in this country, even as we live in highly acrimonious and divisive times. And it seems to me it's a fight. It's a fight to turn outward. It's a fight to turn outward and to figure out in this country right now how we can live united. And so I thank you. I thank you for listening so generously to me this morning. I thank you for the great work that I know that you're doing. And I'm grateful. I'm very grateful to know that we're in this fight together. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's hard to be a sister when you're standing at a distance.